terrorist perspective, if you want to organize an attack, it makes perfect sense to organize it from Belgium. There's a very thin line between criminals and terrorists in Belgium. The Belgian authorities were not prepared. They thought it wasn't possible here. Brussels has long been a breeding ground for terrorism. Now it has become a victim of it. The remnants of a cell that brought terror to Paris had been at large here for months before they struck again at home. But why has this happened to Brussels? How has the EU's political capital also become a centre for terror? And there's another question. Why couldn't they stop this happening? They knew there was a threat to this city, but they weren't able to protect themselves. Quand il y a eu les attentats, chaque mère s'est posé la question si ce n'était pas un de leurs enfants qui était euh, appliqué dans ces attentats. Veronique's son Sammy is a jihadist. Et c'est chaque fois qu'il y a un événement comme ça, on se dit, pourvu que ce ne soit pas mon fils qui soit là derrière, parce que c'est insupportable l'idée d'aller de, tuer des, des innocents. On est totalement avec les victimes, avec les familles des victimes et tout ça, parce qu'on n'a jamais demandé que nos enfants soient partis là-bas. Et ce qu'on dit aussi, c'est que nous, on nous les a kidnappés, nos enfants. On, on, les, on les a fait du lavage de cerveau. Veronique lives in Molenbeek, a borough of 90,000 people, 80% Muslim. Suspected Paris attacker Salah Abdesalam grew up here. And as Europe's most wanted man, avoided detection in this community for four months before being arrested on the 18th of March. Some claim it is a virtual no-go area where the police have lost their grip. It's uh, shocking yeah? and it's only possible, of course, uh, if there are enough people who protect him and who hide him and who feel more solidarity with that criminal than with the society they are living in. And the devastating idea is also beyond all this is that those people who are protecting the criminals, the terrorists, are most of the time people born in Belgium, who went to Belgium schools, who were in theory part of Belgian society. Ce sont des, euh, des gens qui vivent dans des quartiers, euh, un certain ghetto. Des quartiers qui sont défavorisés, des quartiers où il y a beaucoup de difficultés. Malgré euh, certains efforts, le politique au niveau de la région de Bruxelles n'a pas fait le nécessaire pour donner les mêmes chances à tout le monde. Ces gens-là qui décrochent l'école, qui ne terminent pas leurs études, qui ne trouvent pas un boulot, qui vivent à la marge de la société, ces gens-là se sentent rejetés. Molenbeek has been linked to a chilling number of terrorist atrocities. Even with 9-11 uh, in New York, there was a link with, with Brussels. Yeah. Uh, the attack in London, there was a link with Brussels. In Madrid, there was a link in Brussels. Paris, of course, <laughs> we know it very well, there was a link with Brussels. Madrid bomb plotter Hassan El Haski spent time in Molenbeek. <laughs> Amdi Koulibaly, who killed four people in a Paris kosher grocery store, got the guns in Molenbeek. And a number of the November Paris attackers were born in Molenbeek. The entrance to Molenbeek tube station right now is a military checkpoint. This district is considered an incubator for terrorism, a place of jihadi hideouts, where too many men, born European, have grown up to hate everything it stands for. Belgium has, per head of population, become the largest contributor to Islamic State in Europe. 
450 Belgian Muslims have travelled out to Syria and Iraq, including 23-year-old Sami, Veronique's son, seen in this IS propaganda video wearing a headscarf. Bon, mon fils avait 14-15 ans quand il s'est converti à l'islam, alors que moi, euh, je suis catholique et que les jeunes du quartier, c'était tous des jeunes musulmans, euh, bon, euh, ils ne voulaient plus aller à l'église catholique parce que l'environnement, en fin de compte, était un environnement musulman. Petit à petit, il s'est de plus en plus retiré de nous. Et euh, à 23 ans, un jour, il est parti. Euh, il a dit quelque chose à, à, à vous avant de partir ou... Rien du tout. C'est un peu la particularité de tous ces jeunes qui sont partis. C'est que les, les familles n'ont rien vu venir. Olivia's son was killed fighting jihad in Syria. But Sean's journey to radicalization started with a desire to help homeless people. He was doing charity in Brussels. When my son told to me I go to give food to the poor people, I say, wonderful, uh, it's great, um, you're generous. Uh, it was organized by um, a Belge convert um, um, by Islam. He, um, he radicalized the young um, by doing his activities. What we've noticed in Belgium, like in many other countries, uh, these past few years is that they don't recruit in mosques anymore. They recruit in uh, youth organization, they recruit on the street, they recruit on the neighborhood. And then after that you have this kind of snowball effect. One individual gets into the movement, he talks to his brother, to his cousin, to his good friend, uh, and they get radicalized themselves. And so that is why you have very solid, very coherent groups. At this time, this generation of young in Brussels have no hope for the future. Because of this, they are quite easy influence. And uh, also they want to change the world. What they are telling these young people is, you are living in a Belgian society, but this is a society that rejects you. You, have, you are a second-hand citizen. And if you really want to be a real citizen, convert to uh, the Islam, and you'll be a true citizen. You'll find peace with yourself and you will be accepted. So why are young people particularly receptive to that message in Molenbeek? It is a socially deprived area, but you could say that of hundreds of districts across Europe. That said, divides here are stark. Take unemployment among second-generation Moroccan men. It's at 41%, compared to Belgian-born men at 4%. You know, it's maybe a international life, but within Brussels, the people are poor. And there are a lot of chômage of young people, especially the chômage of young people, it's catastrophic. There's no hope. The man responsible for addressing this problem for 20 years was the former mayor of Molenbeek, Philippe Moreau. Have you tried to stop the ghettoization oui, de oui, oui. Molenbeek? Oui, enfin, la ghettoisation, il ne faut pas exagérer par Mais rapport... c'est un grand ghetto. Non, non, c'est un ghetto moins important que dans certaines villes anglaises et que dans certaines euh, cités euh, de la banlieue parisienne. Mais oui, j'ai essayé, j'ai d'ailleurs... Euh, amené, j'ai euh, soutenu et financé avec l'aide des pouvoirs publics des projets qui amenaient une, une population plus classe moyenne, plus classique. At the end of his mayorship in 2012, he wrote a book defending his time at the helm. He doesn't blame ghettoisation so much as the growth of a criminal element within Molenbeek. Ce qui est caractéristique à Molenbeek et qui est Effectivement, un élément troublant, c'est que c'est là que s'est créé autour d'un personnage, à Baout, une cellule criminelle particulièrement euh, importante et violente. C'était le point de départ. Mais à Baout est un personnage qui est connu des autorités, un personnage qui est apparu sur les écrans de télévision traînant des cadavres euh, en Syrie et qui a réussi à travers ses anciennes connaissances, y compris des connaissances que l'on peut appeler des, des copains, à créer 
et, et à mettre en œuvre cette cellule violente. Abdelhamid Abayoud, referred to by Mr. Moreau, was the mastermind of the Paris attacks. In the Islamic State magazine, he bragged of his ability to come and go between Syria, Brussels and Paris. A convicted armed robber, he wasn't the only jihadist with criminal connections. Khaled El Bakrawi, who blew himself up on the metro, and his brother Ibrahim, one of the airport bombers, were also carjackers and bank robbers before upscaling to terrorism. The two of the suicide attackers had these connections to the, to the serious crimes. They were convicted of Kalashnikov type of uh, criminal activities before. Now, if these gangsters can turn into jihadists, we are into a real serious problem. What we're seeing is that uh, there's a very thin line between criminals and terrorists in Belgium. All known terrorists have a criminal record. You know, when you are a gangster, you have been a gangster all your life, you have acquired skills and acquired an attitude, like Al Bakrawi Ibrahim Bokai had already shot on the police with Kalashnikov as a criminal. So you know you are already there. So you know this is also an element that makes this group quite uh, interesting for, for radicalization and also make make good terrorists out of them and fast. To understand how the people plotting this atrocity went undetected, you need to look closer at these radicalized cells and their links to violent crime, which it turns out is something the authorities failed to do. Friday prayers in Brussels' central mosque, four days after the attacks. The large proportion of Muslim immigrants to Belgium are Turkish or Moroccan, but the money for this mosque came from Saudi Arabia. Since the 70s, uh, Saudi influence in Belgium has been growing, and Saudi Arabia was granted the position of leadership in Belgium Islam. There's a group of people who converted to Salafism or Wahhabism. Uh, and you know, the problem with Wahhabism is that if you convert to that, it is a very law obedient ideology. On the other hand, if you make just a little ideological switch, we're changing just one ruling, saying that you can go fight the ruler, you don't have to obey the ruler, then you become a jihadi Salafist. After prayers, a minute's silence is held in memory of the victims. Notre message, c'est dire aux intellectuels, aux imams, de sortir de leur tour, tour d'ivoire, que après ce qui s'est passé, cet événement douloureux, catastrophique, qui euh, euh, sont commis par des, euh, des soi-disant musulmans qui, qui portent leur action au nom de l'islam, nous leur disons que cela ne fait pas partie de l'islam. L'islam, c'est une religion de paix. Ces jeunes-là se basent sur des versets coraniques, comme le verset 5 de la Sourate 9, hein, qui dit euh, euh, « tuez-les, combattez-les », etc. Ouais. Et donc, il faut qu'il y ait une réforme théologique dans ce sens-là pour expliquer ces jeunes-là que ces versets-là n'ont rien à voir avec euh, leur ambition et leur instrumentalisation de ces textes. But over the last decade, two key groups have been responsible for twisting the message of those verses. One was called Sharia for Belgium. This is the group's leader, Fouad Belkacem. People never took them seriously. They were just, uh, people laughed at them. But intelligence services already then warned of don't get fooled by these people. They are actively recruiting among young people in the streets. That was extremely successful uh, here in Belgium in recruiting and radicalizing young individuals. That's uh, a movement that was first based in Antwerp and then that sort of uh, had uh, a branch here in Brussels that, that worked pretty well and as far as we know has been responsible for sending uh, about 80 individuals uh, to 80. Syria, 80, 80. 
The man who wanted to destroy the Atonium is now in prison, along with radical preacher Khalid Zidakani, who ran a separate group. But many of their converts went to Syria. Their associates include Najim Lakrawi, Paris bomb maker, and thought to be one of the suicide bombers who struck Brussels airport. We have left perhaps too much space for some of these individuals, some of these organizations on the principle perhaps of freedom of expression. Uh, you know, where does that, where does that stop? What person ne veut comprendre, c'est que à un moment donné, on a on a quasi encouragé euh, le djihadisme euh, parce que le mot d'ordre en Europe, de la part de tout le monde, était il faut euh, chasser Bachar el-Assad avec n'importe quel euh, moyen. Et ça, ça a créé dans ces communautés, mais pas uniquement à Molenbeek. There was also controversy in Belgium over the treatment of jihadists when they came back. Figures released last month show 117 foreign fighters have returned to Belgium. One of them, Mikael Youn, was sentenced to just six months for his involvement with the terrorist group. The first thing that struck me is that people who fought in Syria uh, could get off with three months, six months sentences, and they are back, uh, you know, walking freely. <laughs> But many weren't picked up at all. Airport bomber Ibrahim El Bakrawi, according to Turkish authorities, was sent back from the Syrian border last year with a warning that he was an IS fanatic. He had also breached parole by going to Turkey, but wasn't arrested on his return. At least in Belgium, they should have rung a bell saying this is a, a criminal convicted in Belgium to nine years of imprisonment, who was released on parole, what is he doing in Turkey, near the Turkish border? There is there's a little bit less than a thousand individuals that are suspected of being related to the Islamic State one way or the other. And there is about a thousand people in the intelligence services or federal police uh, that are in charge of monitoring them. So it's a ratio of one on one. Uh, that makes their job very, very complicated. Ibrahim El Bakrawi and his brother Khalid were able to vanish into the jihadi criminal underworld of Brussels. But these networks didn't just help them hide. Uh, what terrorists want are assault rifles who can do a lot of damage in a very short time frame. And Kalashnikov's types of weapons are very well suited to do exactly that. Now, what we've noticed in, in recent years is the increased availability of exactly those types of weapons onto the criminal market. And it's getting easier for criminals to get their hands on these guns, which means it's also easier for terrorists who are exactly the guns wanting these weapons to actually acquire them on the criminal market. Brussels policing is high visibility, especially now. But critics say Belgian police haven't got a grip on terrorism and gun trafficking because they're too fragmented, with Brussels, for example, having six forces controlled by different mayors and a federal layer of police above that. The Abdeslam uh, brothers, they uh, had been spotted by local police um, more than a year ago uh, before they left uh, for Syria. And apparently that intelligence, that information was then transmitted to the federal police, uh, because in Belgium we have this difference between local and federal police. Uh, and somehow, either it get lost, it wasn't uh, found properly. And the former chief of police for Scarbeck believes federal police are trying to run terror investigations without using the community contacts of local police. They had to be a mid people, because there you can have really uh, good information, exact information. And uh, we, we really controlled the, the commune here. We, we know a lot over the commune. And when I heard after the attacks uh, in Paris that uh, Salah Abdeslam was brought uh, to Brussels, first in, in the commune of Flaken and then uh, here to Scarbeck, my reflection was immediately, oh, if it had been in my time with the team we had, uh, we had him, we, we, we catched him, sure. One of the problems that we have is good data registration. 
We don't know how many guns are being seized in Belgium, for example. We don't know. That, which means we also don't know the context in which they are being seized. So they're not storing the data on the seizing of weapons? Often there is data storage, but it's on paper. And as long as it's on paper, it's very difficult to analyze. So Belgium has a highly marginalized Islamic community, some criminally connected radicals with access to a new supply of weapons, in addition to the bomb training and brutalization that they acquire on trips to Syria. And yet there seemed to be a complacency among some that Belgium wouldn't be a target. I think that the uh, Belgian government always thought that uh, if they let uh, terrorists uh, quiet here in Belgium that they won't have problems. I think that the government wanted to be quiet. No uh, terrorist attacks here in Belgium. You may be safe here, quiet, but don't attack here in Belgium. Do you think they were actively sending out that message? Yeah, I think so, yeah. In recent weeks, authorities also might have thought that they had neutralised the threat. Alleged terrorist Mohamed Belkade was killed during a police raid on a suspected safe house in Forest. The arrest of Salah Abdesalam just days before the attacks was another victory. But these events probably brought forward the attack. When I hear that Salah Abdesalam, when, when he was arrested, was in, interviewed or interrogated, just for one hour, and two days afterwards we had the attacks, then I become angry because I, I am convinced that they could have maybe took out, took out information out of him. Because, you know, like, it could have been my, my children uh, in the metro, you know, it's the same line we take every day. It was very worrying that once they raided the house uh, with all the weapons in it, they also found two detonators. Uh, and you know exactly what that means. It means that there are some explosives out there. They were very close. They even had Salah Abdeslam, Islam, the most wanted terrorist in Europe. And nevertheless, three days later, four days later, these attacks occurred. So maybe there, I believe this country went in five days from complete euphoria to complete defeat. That's the, that, that's the fate of Belgium. On the one hand, the intelligence services are playing catch up. But so too is society. Il faut s'occuper des jeunes qui sont sur le bord du précipice. Et à Bruxelles, il y en a des centaines. Parce que sinon, on va se préparer une nouvelle génération de ce genre. Alors qu'on est qui reviennent et qui fassent ces attentats, ce ne sont pas nos enfants. L'État islamique est une machine qui peut fabriquer des monstres. Fabriquer des monstres avec nos enfants. <rire>